Hey, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of The Trend Report. I'm glad you're joining us for another installment of our CEO Chat Series. I'm excited to welcome to the um, show today Chris Smith, the CEO of KFI Studios. Hey, Chris, how are you? I'm great, Sid. How are you doing, bud? Oh, I'm doing really great. Thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today and um, have you on our CEO Chat Series. And, you know, <clears throat> Chris, we all have a story and we all have a way that we got into this industry and yep. you're not actually from the industry like old people like me are. So I'd be really interested to, for you to share with us how you actually got into the office furniture industry and became the CEO of a manufacturer. Yeah, um, I, I lost a bet. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, um, that's the greatest answer I think I've ever heard. <laughs> Thank you for sharing so, that. No, um, yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting story. And I, I think it's, um, so I, I was in the medical industry and, uh, and sales um, on the fast track with a pretty good sized company. Uh, I don't want to name the name, but, um, and, you know, there's something that I just realized that I, I really didn't enjoy working for the big corporation. Um, I was doing well, but I wasn't happy. And uh, actually a college buddy of mine came to me and, and my current business partner and said his father had this little chair company and he was looking to sell it. So it was at first kind of a joke and it's like, yeah, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. And then it kept coming up. And then um, it, it, at some point we said, well, we'll talk to your father. And, and we ended up talking to him and he offered us an opportunity, I think, that um, you know, we were just young and probably dumb enough to take that we said, you know, he'd help finance because we didn't have any money. And we said, hey, let's uh, let's go for this. So we literally just said, yeah, I can sell medical equipment. I surely can sell chairs. <laughs> I mean, that, that was literally the thought in my head at the time. <laughs> and, and and it just kind of we, we we really when I look back on it, it's interesting because people always ask me, well, well gosh, would, would you recommend that now? And I, I can't say that I, I, I don't know, if, and, and I get asked a lot because we pretty much mortgage our home and everything, and we just said, we're going we're gonna to make this company work, and it was all about just being our own boss and being in control of our destiny, you know, more so than letting um, a larger company control that, and, and that was uh, 23 years ago. So 23 years later, uh, here we are, and we've, we've gone through a lot, survived a lot, but it, it's been a crazy wild ride. And, um, and you know, you know, like, like you mentioned, now that you're in this industry, you can't leave it. You just, you're stuck in it. So somehow that's how it works. But yeah, that's our, that's our quick story. <laughs> so I think my favorite quote there is if I can sell medical equipment and supplies, I can certainly sell office furniture. They're a lot different, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, you know, but, it, but it's the same, it's the same process, right? Yep. If, if, if you, um, selling to me is, it really doesn't matter what the widget is in a lot of the cases, it's, it's relationships. It's, it's figuring out how to service the customer, the end user. Uh, so the process really to me was never, um, any, any different. It, it's just a, it's just a different product and you're selling to a different person and, you know, selling to a surgeon, is a little more difficult sometimes than selling to a, um, a designer. <laughs> sure. oh, yeah. A little bit, a little bit, a little so, bit. Yeah. So Chris, you guys have a pretty compelling story. Yeah. How you've gone from being a commodity type product to where you are today, really focusing on yep. the design community, but for the members of our community that's listening, that doesn't know KFI or who you are, what you do before we jump into that story, would you yep. share a little bit about exactly what it is that you guys do today? You started out with a little chair company. So who are yep. you today? Yeah. So, so today uh, it, it's, um, you know, and, and I always preface this, it's, it's not necessarily where we are today. It's where we're going uh, is the way I like to answer that. So where we are today is, is I would say that we're a very good um, A and D manufacturer of commercial furniture. Mm -hmm. um, where we're going is we want to be, and, and we're striving to get there, is to be really a, a dynamic, um, forward thinking, um, even disruptor in, in the contract furniture industry. And that, that's where we're headed. And so we've got a long way to go. 
Well, I appreciate the vision. <clears throat> I think it's so important for businesses and people to have a vision of where they want to go. You clearly know where you are today. You articulated yeah. it really well. And where you want to go is to be a dynamic um, manufacturer and even an industry disruptor. So what does disruption mean to you, Chris? Yeah, what the, the way I, I view our industry, and it's, it's funny, sometimes I feel like still I'm, I'm a neophyte in this industry, but the way I view our industry is um, I think a lot of us are stuck in an old way of thinking. Um, quite concerning to me in, in some regards because, you know, there's a great old line that I can't remember who said it, but, um, you know, what kills mature industries is um, just, just the methodical, um, you know, marriage to the process that you have mm -hmm. and it kills mature companies and, and you, it, or, or it can, it can kill industries as well. I mean, you, you can, you can go back and look at, um, you know, look at Blockbuster who didn't take Netflix seriously and, and you know, on and on and on. Um, so a disruptor, the way we're looking at it now is um, it starts with design and it flows from there. So we see an opportunity for our company. And I think a lot in our industry is, um, is to really, really hone in on, on why we're doing what we're doing and not just coming out with a product. And let me see if I can explain that. When, 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 when you're a company like us that went from being more of a commodity and then you say, um, wow, we're going to get into the A&D world. It's not just, you don't just jump in there. You, right. it, it's been a methodical planned out, um, you know, really over seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're when you're going into that different industry, I, I think we have a different set of eyes. So, and then when we're saying, well, what we want to get into, um, a great example is this Neocon. We we showed what we call the Jade, which is a task chair. Mm -hmm. um, and when we're looking at a category of task seating, say, which we've never been in before, and then we talk to our designer and say, well we want to get into the task seating business. And then you, then you have to say, well, why in the hell would anybody want to buy a task here from us sure. when you have, you know, 25 companies that you can buy from and you can get in and, and you can get it easy and they got all different, um, you know, good, better, best. So what we want to do as a disruptor is we want to say, why, what, what is different that we can bring and what is our contribution to that area? Um, so we developed and we had it at Neocon is the first ever um, chair that was where we took all hard plastics out of a task chair. Um, something we've been working on for two years and it, it has uh, PET, um, which is the main structure on the back and the underneath. Um, and we literally took pla plastic totally out of the chair. And the reason we did that is because it's better for the environment. Um, and then we broke down every part of the chair and we looked at a lot of people use different structures in there. We took, we can take our product apart now and we can go right down to the screws and say, everything has a story. Um, and then we, then when you look at the design of it, um, we didn't want to design like anybody else's. It's easy to say, Hey, let's just have a chair like so-and-so and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll make it 10% cheaper and we'll see what we can do. So that's what I mean by disruptor. So our goal is to take a category, really dive into it and say, what can our contribution be? What can we do differently that, that matters? Um, and uh, that's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, that, that makes sense. That's a long no, way. Absolutely, absolutely. It does. And I love how you're breaking it down to you. You see challenges that are in our industry. In this yep. case, the use of hard plastic. We understand what it is and why we do it, but we also understand the environmental impact to it and those kinds of things. And you went yep. to a, you hired a product designer. I believe that was Jeff Thiesfeld with Union Product, right? Th that was Jeff for this product. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, and then you said the name of it was Jade? Jade, yeah. Okay, great. And Jade. then you, br you looked at it and you said, okay, we can't just go do a mesh back black task chair and make it 10% better or 10% cheaper than everybody else. We need to look at why are we doing this and what is the real need here? 
and one of the first things was remove the plastics, used a recycled material, a hard plastic, sorry, use a recyclable, a recycled material in PET felt, and you figured out how to yep. make the chair with that, and you spent two years doing it, and then really changing the dynamic, if you will, of the chair, the task chair industry, in my opinion. Yeah, and and that that was the goal, and and Neocon was, um, you know, it was fabulous. The the people that came by our our showroom and took a double look, and because it, it wasn't, they didn't walk by. You know, the first thing they noticed was the unique design, mm -hmm. because the design is so beautiful. It's it, we we took we we um, you know, we took all the kind of the tech look out. There's too many, to, in our opinion, chairs that are have this you know, tech look or yep. futuristic look, it's fine if, if that's what people want. But we said, let's do something totally different. Um, let's make this thing a beautiful, beautiful piece of, you, you know, a beautiful chair. And, and then the people that were drawn into it, and then once we told them the story and we said, guess what? And we, they're just, um, you know, we heard iconic from one person. Now, will that happen? I don't know. But that's what I mean by disruptor. Um, so, and we're we're looking at that in a in a lot of different categories, and um, and and we're venturing out with a lot of I think very um, very interesting designers in Europe now, That's and we're challenging them. We're challenging them. We're saying. We want you to design something that's never been done before, and you know some of them are going like, you know, who the hell are you? <laughs> but 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 that's what I mean by that. We're, we we don't you know we don't want to just be a company that says, hey, we've got this, this, and this, um, and um, and and it's still we're evolving. Uh, and always people always ask me that, but but it's fun. It's well, a I lot think of it's fun. Great, Chris, and I appreciate how you're really thinking about things differently, and you're looking at ways to have a positive disruption and positive impact on our industry yeah. which we need and i think your parallel to netflix and blockbusters is spot on because unfortunately there are a lot of businesses and a lot of people in our industry that are not paying attention to what's happening around them and yeah. it's going to have a negative impact and i think more people need to really think about what is possible what can we do differently or how can we change things or what else can we bring to our customers that they need that we can provide profitably and do really, really good job at it? Now, absolutely. We could talk about that for a whole separate podcast, yeah. right? But let's talk for, let's go back to the original question, Chris, which is yeah. the story of how you went from a commodity to a design driven brand. And you mentioned it's been a multiple year process that you laid out. So share with us that story a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, um, so I think what's interesting about where, why we did this um, and, and the time in which we did it, um, our sales were growing, 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 growing. And we made this decision while we had our record year of sales, which is not when most people sure. pivot. So as we're doing growing, we said, you know what, we, 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 we try to really, which is so hard, especially now, but you know, where are we going to be in five years, you know, and, and I always say we, we do five year business plans, but you, they're good exercise, but you got to rip them up and change them all the time. But what, what we did is we said, you know, we're at a crossroads with our company. Um, if we stayed at a commodity company, um, probably our play would be all about which it was. It was about uh, delivery, you know, in stock and cost. Sure. Those those were the two drivers. Um and if we kept on that route, we saw all the um, all the Chinese companies coming in and we just saw this race to the bottom. And if we did that, we probably would have started, you know, probably selling direct, you know, to compete. We would have done a lot of different things, maybe maybe had distribution places all over the country. Uh, and we didn't want to do that. So we, we said, let's pivot. Um, let's do it slowly. And let's become an A and D line, and and you had to do it slowly because, quite frankly, we we didn't know that market. So, sure. you know, for us, you got to really humble yourself. Um, and we we really were sponges of just learning everything about um, the industry. Uh, everybody just um, figuring it out and then figuring out our path. So we. We slowly just moved the ship each year a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, sunsetted some of the commodity stuff 
and improved our rep organizations and improved all of our processes. And it was a, a total paradigm shift for everybody in our facility um, of believing that we were an A&D company. And a lot of people thought I was kind of crisp. Well, you know, we're not an A&D company. We're a stature company. I said, no, we're not a stature company. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- that's kind of how it started. Um, and, you know, hiring designers and, and then just keep, and, and we made mistakes and we'll keep making mistakes, but we forgive ourselves and, and move on. Well, hopefully along that process, anytime that we make a mistake or a bad decision, we learn something from it. <clears throat> we learn what not to do yeah. next time or what we would do differently the next time. And yep. I love how intentional that it was that you said, okay, this is where we are today. This is where we want to be in five years and in 10 years. And these are the steps that we have to start. Uh, taking in order to get there and one of the first things that you said was we have to be a sponge and we have to learn about the industry yes. and you have to learn about what the a and d community needs and wants versus what the commodity community needs and wants because they are completely different yes yeah we we went from really um you, you know our core competency was in stock and price to really you know, if you ask me R4, it's going to be service. It's going to be design first, quality and comfort, and then sustainability. So we went from cost of delivery to service design, quality, comfort, and sustainability. And those are, those are the things that we build around now. Um, so that, that's, that's where we think. And you'll notice what's out of there is cost. So cost is no longer in our model. Not that we're, we don't care about cost, but it's not our driver anymore. Um, so that, that's kind of how we did that shift. Well, one of the most important things I think any business needs to know is who you are and what is your value prop and what are your guiding principles? Yeah. Those three combined in four words, design, quality, comfort, and sustainability, all which are really important, not only to our industry, but to the dealer community and to the design community that yeah. is your primary target. Cause we know based on statistics provided by a lot of other companies, they have a tremendous amount of specification power and really can put your brand and your products on the map if you're approaching them the right way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, another thing that, that, was, that was very um, also humbling for me, which I think a lot of companies go through or should, in my opinion, is we went through a whole branding exercise. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it was, you know, because I can sit here and tell you so many things about our company, but when I was really forced with questions of who you are, why you exist, what's your purpose, and I'm going, oh, man, these are some questions that I, I had to really think about. Uh, and it was great because it, 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 you know, it really opened our eyes to say, because we do a lot of really great things here, you know, taking care of our employees, you know, paying for health care, but we don't talk about it because we don't do it, you know, as part of our, our, our business, it's just what we do, but it, it made us really more internally um, define that, that, you know, we're, we're here to kind of leave a legacy. We're, we're here to kind of pass this on to other people. We're here to lift up our employees. So we have a lot of other things that, that really happen in that branding exercise that um, it, it's kind of cool because it, it, it really takes it out of, I think if I came in every day and thought I just sold furniture, I'd be bored. But now, you know, we, we, I, I come in every day and, you know, we're, we're a change agent. We're, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, do things differently. We're trying to leave a legacy. So there's, there, it, 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 makes, it makes your daily job more exciting too, but it's, it's a very good exercise to go through if anybody hasn't, just to ask yourself those questions. Um, well, I could not, as a coach and a business consultant, I could not agree with you more. And every business and every person should answer those questions. Yes. And it is yes. so yep. important, right? But it is so important. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I'm, no, I was just agreeing. Yeah. <laughs> well, you mentioned something about the last couple of years and how busy you've been over the last couple of years. And yep. when I met you guys, it was probably right at two years ago and spring breakout was the first time I'd met Katie, the first time I met you yep. and the first time to be exposed to your brand. Yep. <clears throat> and um, what a great little company that you have, which is really what's drawn me to get to know you guys a little bit better yep. and then to be able to interact with you some, but 
the last couple of years have been a little bit crazy in our world, but you guys have made huge investments. You got yep. a showroom at the Merchandise Mart, which is a, obviously it is not an inexpensive investment, right? Yeah. And then you rebranded. You brought to market a lot of new products. So share with us a little bit about that story, um, especially the products and the new brand. Yeah. Um, you, it, the interesting thing when when all of our worlds kind of blew up. A couple of years ago, we, we like everybody were a little nervous. Sales sales tapered off, um, but we again we made a decision to be a post COVID company. Um, we did not have anything, you know. A lot of people, which is not saying is wrong, but for us, we just said, and, and my message, everybody, we're a post COVID company. Not that we, you know, our goal was to make sure everybody was healthy, everybody was safe. Mm -hmm. But as far as a company goes, we didn't have home office. Um, I, I'm actually shocked that so many people, you know, tried to push that way, to be honest with you, in the contract furniture market. We didn't have screens. We chose not to get into any of that stuff. So we really um, said, let's let's invest our money in um, new product development and the branding and let's come out a stronger company um, so we can hit the ground running after COVID was over. That that was kind of the message. And, 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 you know, it, it's one of those things you got to believe. Um, it, and there were times where, you know, I said, wow, I, I wish we had a home office desk or I wish we had a screen because everybody's selling them. And you, you really kind of got to stick to your, your belief um, and, and, and your plan. But um, yeah, I, I think it was the right call for us. Mm -hmm. And so it was really just product development, um, a lot of investment in that, a lot of tooling investment. Um, we did the whole branding exercise yet yeah, during COVID. And, and now that we've come out of that, hopefully, um, I think we're a much better company moving forward. So, so you've got a new logo, you've got yep. new branding elements, you've got a new story that you're telling or a yep. story that you're telling in a different way now. Of who Correct. You are and yep. what you do. And then, You've introduced a lot of products. How many products have you introduced in the last two to three years, Chris? <sighs> um, <laughs> That's a great answer right there, by the way. It's a great answer. Yeah, you know, I'm looking. I have this huge board here um, with, with all of our stuff. I mean, I, I'm going to say we, we've introduced um, probably at least 15, maybe, maybe 12 to 15. And um, we have a build out of ideas and designs. Um, three years out now wow. that we're working on. So that's, great. that's a, yeah, lot, it's a big, it's a different approach than what you get from a commodity company, right? Yes. A commodity yes. company, somebody brings in and says, Hey, I've got this chair. I can deliver it to you for this dollar amount. <clears throat> we can yeah. have container loads of it here for you in this many months. And you start yeah. selling where true product development takes time. It takes a roadmap. You need to see what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Yeah. And you know, that's the one of the things that, I had heard until we got into it is, is how long that initial idea to, to finish product. And obviously with supply chain issues, it's taken longer and longer and longer just to get things um, to the finish line. So we've really learned to um, keep so many things in, in the pipeline. And uh, so, yeah, so we're, we're, we're hitting our stride now, I think with design and um, you know, each year I get excited because next Neocom we're going to have, what I hope to be another game changer at Neocon next year um, awesome. in our industry. Yeah. So Chris, I mean, I really appreciate the approach that you guys are taking and what it is you're doing and how you're actually, in my opinion, leading the way for other small businesses to see how they can reinvent themselves and what they can do differently in order to increase their market share and to grow their business. Um, yep. But we've been talking about the last couple of years and you just mentioned supply chain. So as a CEO, could you share with us a little of your insights of how you have managed and navigated KFI through the last couple of years with all the challenges that have been facing us? Yeah, um, it, it hasn't been easy, but what we've done and any, any CEO or any, any business person is going to know it's 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 all about cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the things that we did. Like I mentioned, we we did not um, we did not pivot and say, "Oh gosh, we're going to load up on something that's COVID related." 
uh, and, I, and again, I think that was a good move. Um, the second thing that we did is our key products, we doubled down on inventory, which was a scary proposition. And, um, you know, my business partner, Scott's the one who, uh, you know, really said, we're, we're going to, on our key products, we're going to double down because we knew that the time frame, and we, and we don't get everything from overseas. I mean, we're kind of a, I would say a hybrid. We make half of our stuff here. And, but any, you know, there's a, there's always a component that you need from overseas. From somewhere. So the, the time frame in which that, that, that happened, um, we doubled down on our key product so that we would hopefully have um, a good amount of product to sell and not be a company that's out of stock of everything. Uh, and that's been a great thing because we're shipping on time now. Or we're on normal ship times right now. What's normal? The, uh, well, we, we, we still have a compelling in-stock program of 48 hours. And, and then we do you, you know tables and stuff in two to three weeks. And then we'll have our custom stuff, which can be four to five or whatever. So, so we still, yeah, go ahead. Well, the reason I ask that question is, you know, I talk to a lot of dealers and I talk to a lot of brands throughout the course of a day and a week and even a month. And I hear stories of lead times being 40 weeks for one company, 20 something weeks for another company, 14 weeks for another one. And you've got a 48 hour program, a two to three week program, and then a four to six week program, which to me as a longtime furniture guy, that's normal. That's what we're used to. So you've got yeah. to go back to that place that of normalcy, if you will, with your lead times. So, yeah, I, I don't know if a lot of people realize, but, you know, things are things are shutting down in start certain areas again uh, and quite a shock to us. So we're not going to be perfect. Um, we're just trying to make sure that, you know, we're not one of these companies that's out 20 weeks, 40 weeks mm-hmm. and can still have a good amount of product. That, that we can service the customers. And so that, that's one of the things that we've managed, uh, but it, it's been really difficult with container costs and anybody will share that with you. And uh, it, it's, it's, you know, you can get the product finished and then you've got to get a container and then you get the container and then you got to get a, a boat to put it on. And once you get the boat, then you get it over here and it might set out in, in the, you know, the ocean for forever. And then once it gets off, it might set in that yard forever because they can't get a chassis Mm -hmm. and it's it's really maddening for anybody and uh, not just our industry so it's been hard but i i feel that we've we've managed it very well um and again we won't be perfect uh we're we're concerned about some products being out of stock again but um well yeah i think what i would add to that is that i don't think anybody expects you or anyone else to be perfect yeah. Um, and again, what I appreciate here is the, the leadership that you're showing us and what you're telling us, what you're telling our community right now is that the struggle of leading a company through what we've been through and even continuing forward the, is real. The challenges that you're facing are real, both yes. the rising cost of material, the rising cost of transportation, the issues with labor in trying to get product from where you've ordered it or pieces from where you've ordered it from to your facility in Kentucky, the struggle is real and it changes all the time because there's so many different things that are impacting us. And what I would like to say to our community, especially our dealer community that's listening is we have to understand that people like Chris are doing their best to navigate these waters and to give you a quality product when you need it. But there are so many circumstances that impact you on a daily basis that we have to give you grace at the same time. And we have to understand that these are challenges that every manufacturer is facing. Yeah, I agree. And it, it's hard. And I realize it because you've got the customer on, you know, the dealer, they got the customer. I, I think the biggest challenge and I'll speak for anybody out there is we, we, you get, you know, the worst thing you can do is, is, is give the dealer bad information and they pass it on, you know, that whole, whole scenario. But the, the challenge is, is you will have a container that is supposed to show up a month ago. And then all of a sudden you'll have a container that is supposed to show up two weeks from now, show up before the container a month ago, if that makes sense. And you're going, you know, how did the heck did that happen? And a lot of times it's because the container gets stuck in a, in a shipyard 
and they'll put it somewhere and they, they can't reach it. And they're doing first in first out just to get rid of the congestion. So in fairness to anybody out there, we get bad information daily <laughs> on this is going to show up here. And then the next day it doesn't. So everybody's doing the best they can, everybody. Um, and, and it has been very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> You're not alone, Chris. I talked to so many business leaders that are yeah. experiencing the same thing. But I think the message to the community is let's give our manufacturers and our partners a little bit of grace and doing that for the most part. It's called the 80 20 rule or maybe the 90 10 rule. You guys are doing the very best you can in navigating unknown waters and dealing with so many inconsistencies and changes. Yeah. Or if you need product, just come to call, call us. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. So, Chris. Why would a dealer want to do business with KFI? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question, Sid. And let me try to be concise with the answer is when, when we look at all the other manufacturers in our space and, and whether it's mid-market or, or A&D, uh, we see for one, what we just had the conversation is there's, there is, even though lead times are disrupted now because of COVID and supply chain issues in a normal normal world, KFI ships quick. So forget about COVID. Uh, we are never going to be a company. We can have the best, most awesome design, and we are always going to have a speed component to it. So if that dealer, um, if that customer needs something quickly, we are always going to have that speed component. Um, our design is going to be as good as anybody's out there. And uh, I'm, I'm very confident of that. I couldn't say that two years ago but we will have as good a design as anybody. I don't, I don't care who it is. Our quality is going to be as good as everybody. This is where I think also we differ, we differ is comfort. Um, big, big um, important thing that I'm, I'm shocked when I sit in a lot of beautiful chairs and they're not comfortable. And all of our chairs were very, um, very serious about making it also beautiful and, and comfortable. And, our price, even though price isn't an issue, you're going to find that we are um, maybe a breath of fresh air with um, when you when you pair our design with, with with our cost and the sustainability as well is something that we're going to we're getting very serious about. Not that we haven't been, but again, we're thinking differently about it. Um, and we're also a company when you look at it. Everybody says this, but you, you can ask other people. We get one sale, we're going to get the second because we're so easy to deal with. Uh, we're a pretty laid back company uh, being where we are, I think, but we're very serious about what we do. Mm -hmm. But the experience you get all the way through with us, I think is as good as anybody's. And, and you know, also we're on, we're investing in all the platforms. We're on CET Designer now. I mean, we're redoing our website and it's going to be, you know, our website is ever changing to always make it easier to get information. So our new website is going to be just dynamite. And, um, you know, we've got a configurator on there and we're, we're, we're doing all the things that I think somebody would need to say, hey, I want to specify that company. Our warranties are fabulous. So I think we have a good package and we're really in that ancillary space. You know, we're we're in that um you know, space that you can really, if a designer is looking at, and you, you can see this, they don't, it used to be, it's a steel case space and everything's steel case. Um, and you look at all the new spaces and, and we've got products that you can put all over the place and, um, and fill in. And, and we're, we're having success. It's getting our name out and getting our, getting our brand out there. So sure. probably a long winded answer. <laughs> it was a great answer. And, and I think my key takeaway from it is that, you're working really hard to be easy to do business with. Yeah, we, we've, um, we've always been that way. We really built the company on that, I think. And uh, everybody here just does a wonderful job. So I think and most people that, that deal with us, they're like, and we do it. We, you know, it's so funny to get on my soapbox, but things aren't that hard, but it, it, it's all about trust and it's all about doing what you say you're going to do. And once you, once you do that, and I'm amazed at how many people don't do what they say they're going to do. Um, I'm not naming names or companies, but I tell other people all the time, just do what you say you're going to do. If you say that you're going to call somebody back, call them back. If you say you're going to do this, do it. And then you build trust and then uh, trust breaks down all the barriers. But so 
I really appreciate that, Chris. Um, you know, in my line of work, um, you know, being a solopreneur, basically, that's pretty much all I have to rely on, right, is doing what you say you're going to do. And it's very yeah. refreshing to listen to the leader of the organization talk about how that you're empowering and encouraging your people to just do what you say you're going to do. Just, just do it. it. It's really a life. You take it with life. You, you do what you, you, with your spouse, your friends, or anybody. It's, yep. yeah. Just, so just, just so, do it. Yeah. Chris, <clears throat> um, I really appreciate you hanging out with me today for a few minutes yeah. and sharing a little insights and giving us a glimpse about who KFI Studio is, what it is you're doing, and those kinds of things. But the one thing that we have not talked about is something you just mentioned, which is your location. I, obviously, you're in Louisville, Kentucky, which is not necessarily a go-to um, location for a furniture manufacturer, but you're in a beautiful state. Obviously, you've got races and the Kentucky Derby and beautiful. I've been to Kentucky. It's absolutely gorgeous. And yep. bourbon. So I, your roots are there. So you're going to stay in Louisville. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, we're in a great location. I mean, we, we can service 70% of the country in two days um, in shipping. And we have, a you know, UPS has their international hub here. So location-wise, we're we're great. Yeah. And we, we have warehousing in Indiana, but yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, um, we're staying put right here. Do you, yeah. um, do you bring a lot of people up uh, to the factory, Chris? You know, we, we, we don't do it enough. We should. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're, we're trying to, um, you know, we've got a showroom built out here. Got a lot, a lot of local and regional people. Sorry. I have my dog coming up in my lap <laughs> right now, but hey, buddy. Right there. If you're but, watching on YouTube, you just got to meet Chris's dog. Chris, what's the oh, name? I didn't know this was. This is Gumbo. So. Ah, I love that. Now that's uh, that's a that is not a Kentucky name. That's a Louisiana name. That that is a Louisiana name. So that's a whole another story. <laughs> another story for another podcast. <laughs> that's yeah. Great. Well, Chris, if people that are listening today would like to get in touch with you or with KFI, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah, I mean, you can go on our website. Um, you, you can. You're welcome to um, LinkedIn. I mean, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, and my, my email address I don't mind sharing it is c smith at kfistudios.com. It's c smith at kfistudios.com. Well, we will be sure in the show notes that are on the web page. <clears throat> we will yep. be sure to drop all of your contact information, your LinkedIn. Uh, your email address, as well as the KFI Studios website address for people to go and check out all the great things you're doing. Just remember, if you do reach out to Chris or anyone on the team, let them know you heard about him here on the Trend Report so Chris knows how you're coming to him. And Chris, it's been an honor to be able to get to know you and Katie and the rest of your team to watch your journey as you guys are growing and introducing all kinds of new products, man. I wish you much success for the remainder of 2022 and the future. So I appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, Sid. Appreciate That's it, man. Oh, you're welcome. That's a wrap for today's episode. We look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. Go out there and make today great.